Hi, Editing Alexis here. Um, there was a problem with Alexis' audio track this episode, and unfortunately, it, I wasn't able to properly fix it. Uh, this should be good for next episode, though. Um, have a good listen. No. You, no, 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 you can't, Pam, okay? Go lie down. I mean, we, we could use a guest. If, I mean, we, we could use a guest. If, yeah, but she's not going to make any noise. <laughs> She's just going to stare at me. Okay, right. So let's um, let's get going. I've done all the transitions. I've got it all ready. So yeah, here we go. Uh, you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Then let's just. Uh, you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Then let's just. Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, hello. And Alessio. Hello, everyone. And I'm your host, Fen. Uh, this is the first episode of 2022, so um, I hope a Christmas or holiday break, or whatever you're doing, and you're not working too hard at the start of the year, because, I mean, who wants to start a new year off with hard work? That's uh-huh. it's a bad trend for the year, so take it easy and don't overwork yourself, because somebody else will. A happy new year to everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Nemo's War the North Sea Trilogy, and Hasbro's reprint of HeroQuest. But first, during the period we've been off on break, there's been a number of interesting events, so we're just going to start with a little dip into some of the major news points. Uh, the first one, uh, which has caused a lot of controversy at this point, happened in the end, is Kickstarter announcing that they're going to go into uh, a blockchain version of the platform. Um, I am so tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, come on, Simon, doing this and uh, Red Rider Games talking about NFTs, and of course Adam Poots Games disastrously trying to do it back on it, which that that was a good move walking back on it. It's all like it's very clear that the board gaming community is not interested in blockchain, NFTs, and crypto yeah. at all, and they they don't want that. Um, it's a big, complicated subject. I would recommend uh, watching Shelf Stories. Uh, the episode he goes through a lot of things. He talks about some positives and negatives, and even gives a position where he lands on everything. It's a pretty good start, but there's a lot there. Speaking of things that uh, people weren't really asking for, Magic Arena has had a major um, mess up where they released a new digital only format, which effectively is them saying we want to be Rune Terror or Hearthstone. Um, and uh, they put up a load of new updated nerfed cards up there with cards people were sick and fed up of. And they were like, hey, you can play this format where these new cards are not very powerful. Then they revealed about 22 or something. New cards that were all ridiculous. Oh, Fen, I just realized something. <laughs> Magic is definitely going to go with NFTs at some point this year. Oh, if... Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, they don't really need to because they print secret layers, which are like physical NFTs. They're not quite NFTs, but they're limited edition. We has I just like maybe they'll do arena NFTs, but maybe not because the community has been very responsive to this and not in a good way because what happened is these new updated cards and nerfs also gone into um, arena's eternal format which is called historic now previously you could almost if you wanted to and people like that but now the nerfed cards for standard have been changed in historic and they were fine as they were in historic and people's decks have been completely destroyed like i i I'm a historic player because I can't keep up with standard. It's too expensive. I can just about manage to keep up with historic. I just got on top of summer now at the end of the year and they've released all of these rares and they are bonkers and they're crazy and they've also nerfed cards I was relying on and I can't play. I can't even play historic brawl where you need one of each without being overpowered and blown out by some crazy stuff. So it's a it's a weird time. People have uninstalled, uh, made any official announcement on what they're going to do about it. Basically, people are like, Alchemy is a format's okay, but why did you do this to Historic? And what the hell are you going to do about it? And what are you going to do about the fact that this game was really expensive to play anyway? If you want it to be 
competing with Hearthstone and especially Rune Terror, you need to do something about the economy. So it should be fun to see where we go with that. Um, you know, Wizards have don't really have a great track record in this kind of stuff, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, on to two more subjects of news which I think are a bit more positive. The first one is that Asmodee, which was floated for sale recently, has been bought, which is a bit of a surprise. So anyone who's not familiar with who the Embracer Group is, they are a Swedish-based company that you may be familiar with the name THQ Nordic or Nordic Games. And they're massive. Like in Sweden, video gaming, board gaming are actually big things because it's so dark for so much of the year that it's indoors in the evening because you don't really want to be outside too much. Um, and I, I'm actually excited about this. I, I know Asmodee, I'm not thrilled with the way they were ha behaving before, but I think a lot of that was the old pump and dump strategy. You know, uh, like the, the equity group holding it. We're gutting things, trying to make the everything as desirable as possible and just kind of like looking to get it offloaded um embrace and group have a record of caring about their products and there's some fun things in here uh just just first of all embrace a group includes uh coffee stain studios and ghost of all embrace a group includes uh coffee stain studios and ghost ship games who do deep rock galactic there's a board game coming out from them soon um so that's like really cool also embrace group own gearbox and gearbox yeah gearbox is gears of war if i remember correctly am i right yeah. gearbox and gearbox yeah gearbox is gears of war if i remember correctly am i right gearbox is borderlands and borderlands yes uh, but border, gearbox is borderlands yes that's it um and that opens a whole lot of potential for other licensing things but most of all i really feel that embrace group tend to care I really feel that Embracer Group tend to care about making stuff. And this is a move where they've gone, we want to do board games. This is an easy way for us to get a whole big load of licenses and, and established designers and distributors. Boom, job done. And and I think this is a them stepping into the and I think this is a them stepping into the arena. So it could be exciting times. It could be terrifying yeah. as well, but I, I think though if um if, if Embracer Group are looking to grow Asmodee, which seems to be, that's the reason you'd buy something like this if you're not an equity firm, which they're not, then um, I think we're going to see this if you're not an equity firm, which they're not, then um, I think we're going to see maybe some good stuff. I'm going to be optimistic about it. Oh, uh, I have uh, good news about uh, crowdfunding, uh, the, the good version uh, too. <laughs> it looks like game found. As, as set up uh, a way to have uh, all kind of publisher pay their VAT in advance. So they offer instruments with pre-calculated VAT and a lot of uh, tools and stuff to manage uh, within the pledges instead of to shipping and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, that is good. They are really competing to be the only alternative in this year. Yep, yep. I mean, well, we're going to talk about one of the other alternatives as well a bit later, but uh, it, it is, it's good news. I do very much want GameFound to, um, doesn't feel too bad to be supporting. Yeah, in the meantime, I, I don't know if we need to mention the brawl is happening at Alex's place. Yeah. Uh, oh, you 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 can hear the the sound. They should be cut by by uh by the time this goes up. No, you will cut this. <laughs> you will cut it all. You just sound yeah. extremely uh, strange that you refer to noise that do not exist. Yeah, I think you might want to speak with a doctor. Maybe you're hearing stuff that isn't there, Alessio. That's yeah. weird. <laughs> no, I heard it as well. Okay, I'm sure. Man. I think you are. I think you are. Um, let's end, though, with oh. a really cool note, which in this airs, Cora Quest will be in people's hands, which is like, yes. hooray! That was that was a nice project, and I'm really looking forward to having getting my hands on it. Yeah, we, we probably... Uh, we are having it now, even if we don't have it now. So, cool. It's the one computer pledge. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, so with the news to one side, let's get into the standy catch-up. What have you been up to, Alessio? Oh, a couple of things, actually. Brian Ball, mostly. 
uh, I received uh, the game, it's the new Pierce Investor game, and uh, well, uh, it game, it's the new Pierce Investor game, and uh, well, uh, it uh, will very well deserve uh, its, its own review. But uh, all I can say is that uh, it's a good trick taking game. It's very good. It's like uh, trick taking version of the. the so it, it's uh, it's a very cool game. I, I played like eight games, uh, three of them in the same day, uh, and I am hooked. It's very very good. Yeah, yeah, I've heard very good things about it, and I appreciate the. Uh... The goals to keep it very um, Irish the period, which is always nice. Yeah, it looks like uh, very historically accurate. Even it's not just uh, pretty Irish. Even the the the, na- the the Danish names of the Viking invaders like Estrid are kept in their original tongue language. So it's pretty cool. It's uh, pretty accurate, and that's one of the two things I'm doing, because the other one is uh, there's actually a let's play of only games for Nintendo Switch, since we talked about four of the, uh, this game, there's Moon Landing, there's Peg Cat Landing, there's Peg Cat, this goes to New York, there's startups, uh, and the game costs uh, like $20, and that's all, and at online play, and pass and play or not sit, uh, I bought it, I have to say, <laughs> it's a hit. Uh, my kids love uh, my kids love Peck Up is Goes to New York, so it's a very very good uh, thing. Also because it's Nintendo Switch, so it's localized. I I really have it as a recommendation. Of course, this depends on the number of players you can find online play. But if you have friends and you uh, and you uh, and you want to try these old games, this is another way to test them. Yeah, but let's just be honest here. If you listen to this podcast and you've not bought a fake artist goes to New York startups and insider, you need to get on that seriously. <laughs> like the, the oink games can vary, but those three are some of the best board games you can play, and they cover a bunch of different experiences. So, yeah, startups is complicated, so I advise to play it with experienced people. But fake artists is very very good. I have to say it can be played even without the assets, but it's a lot of cool if you buy it. So <laughs> that's cool. since my box of chaos in the old world is basically falling apart. I think I'll deluxify it by printing and getting stuff. I'll probably record what I'll be doing because this will be my pet project for 2022. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a young. That's a young. Eric Lang with the Games Workshop. It has to be with actually Fantasy Flight, of course, but with the Games Workshop's IP. And it's a very, very cool game. One where you can see the chaos played in a smart way. So it deserves the. Yeah, it's a very old game at this point, and it's very expensive. And that's me. Yeah, it's very expensive. I think that. I, I never had the Hornet Rat expansion. I see it sold for two thousand for two hundred dollars. So yeah, I was gonna lot. say if you don't have the Horned Rat edition it's not worth as much. Yeah not worth it, as much. Yeah, it's not worth it. Uh there he, he, truth to be told, uh, there are dark corners in the internet when you can uh, where you can get the, just the cards for the old gods and maybe but just for the fifth player, it's not worth it, probably. But but just for the fifth player, it's not worth it, probably. But that's me. That's the beginning of the year. And what have you been up to, Alexis? What have I been up to? Um, well, I just started my um, uh, my new job, so I've been uh, very busy with that. Those uh, those past past few um, those past few weeks. Um, other than that, I've not been playing that much, uh, that many um, uh, board game. I played, uh, what's the name, uh, the name of it? The I, I played a very fun party game with my fa- uh, with my family recently, where you had to. Um, uh, it's one of those uh, those fast game where you have to mime the cards that you are given, and uh, as the rounds goes on, people know the worlds that are going around, and they like it. It gets harder and harder to to 
guess which one are, are coming. Um, I'll find the name mm. of the the game and I'll I'll put it. Oh, in. that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, <laughs> it it's very good. It, for the first one, you have to describe it without using the world. Yeah, the it, yeah. Monikers, isn't it? Monikers. Um, maybe the problem is that I played it in French, so the, I had the French title. Uh, yep. I forgot Mon the French title. So. Monikers is first round clue givers can give whatever yeah, they want. Second the round one. they can only say one word, and third round they can only use gestures and yeah. charades. Extremely fun. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Shut up and sit down. Did a their own like expansion edition to it. So yes, it's a it's, it's, it's a good game. It was very good. Uh, and I also received uh, Unbroken today, so I'll be finally able to play this um, after <laughs> yeah after a long time waiting for it. But I'm I'm pretty happy. Uh, and wish Artem all the best with its, his next his next ah, next game, hoping that uh, it won't be with um, Golden Bell. Now, for a very gossipy news, uh, if people liked uh, Kickstarter Trainwreck, I'd recommend them to have a look at the Demon City Kickstarter. Uh, they've been telling for people for two years that this art book was almost done, and recently the main writer went off his rockers and started telling people to send affidavits if they believed that they had lied. Uh, following that, the Kickstarter's creators had to put out an update telling people not to sign legal documents from their main writer uh, while the guy is still in the comments being a dick. Uh, it's very funny to look at. Also, I decided that for 2022 I will correct all your Latin, uh, your Latin nouns. So it's not Agricola, it's Agricola. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> not Affidavit, it's, it's an Affidavit. Ah. You can yeah. well. We we do pronounce it Agricola anyway. Um, Agricola. Yeah, I I don't know anyone who pronounces Agricola who's I, from Europe. Agricola. Agricola. It's Agricola. Yeah. yeah Agricola. Agricola. Yeah. Agricola. 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 No. Yes. Agricola. We got it. We got it. There we go. What about you, uh, fan? How have you been? Uh, I've been I've been fine. Well, uh, I'm not going to go through what I've been doing because we're talking about what I've been doing. It's ah. these three games here. Um, although I did get the solitaire mode for Concordia and I haven't been able to touch it because I've oh. been too busy. So, yeah, that's that's it on my part is we'll talk about what I've been doing. Well, uh, wonderful. Yeah. And so speaking of solitaire game. Mm -hmm. We're going to go take ourselves far away beneath the surfaces of the ocean on a journey with the public domain hero. And one of my favorites um, of all of the these heroes that fall into the public domain. And one of my favorites um, of all of the these heroes that fall into the public domain with uh, Captain Nemo. So do, Alexis, tell us all about this uh, solo extravaganza <laughs> that is Nemo's War by Chris Taylor. Yes. Um, so... Nemo's War is an amazing adventure game. Um, so, Nemo's War is an amazing adventure game uh, coming from Victory Point game. Uh, it sets the player as Captain Nemo at the hand uh, at the head of the Nautilus. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of the game is that you can play it with four different objectives uh, that will play it with four different objectives uh, that will weight the victory condition differently. So even if you play the game a lot, there will always be very a lot of uh, different uh, a lot of different version that you're going to play uh, it. The four different victory conditions are either science, exploration, uh, war, or anti-imperialism. And I just a little aside, uh, Joel Verne has always had uh, been quite outspoken about um, his, his distaste for imperialism, even though a lot of his exploration do deal with uh, colonialism and all of that. But uh, it, he always described uh, described it as a source of uh, brutality and injustice. Um, and, uh, I think that that exact quote comes from uh, 2,000 Miles Under the Sea. Uh, and I, I kind of have to, to commend the game for like not shying away from that legacy and going full on like uh one of the victory uh story of the game is to basically uh free the people that the um, government as uh uh is exploiting around the world i think that's a pretty pretty fun idea for a game like this uh but how the game is played well the game's main mechanics are a mixture of uh, action point management and area management uh every turn new ships are going to up uh, to uh, pop up around the map and of 
if at any point there's too many uh, ships from the British government that are hunting you, you will lose. So you need to travel around the Seven Seas, trying to explore, collect treasure, go on adventure, and uh, uh, draw on those ships. Uh, how, how do you say it in the nautical term? I found it with David here. The stories are and adventures are represented by little story cards with die roll tests to, to make. Uh, and one of the best thing about the game is its risk management mechanic as you can per, uh, as you have three different uh quote unquote life bar one of them for your ship's um gen health one of them for the crew's morale and one of them for captain nemo's sanity uh and you can when going on those little adventures you can um risk some of those aspects and uh risk taking damage to them uh, for an exchange for a uh, better dice roll uh, it's quite fun. Uh, you unlock different technological upgrades for the Nautilus that are randomly decided at the start of the game, so it makes the game extremely different uh, as you play along. Uh, the game is supposedly a one to four player cooperative game, but I have never seen the point of playing it with more than two player, and even two player is it's not that um, good as a two player game because the rules are basically uh, one player handles the movement and the card reading and the other handles the dice roll and the upgrade selection and mm. it's supposed to be a little bit of a oh you are the first mate and that uh, player is the captain and you you have like different responsibility around the ship yeah. like um uh captain <coughs> sonar i guess mm -hmm. yep well, a little bit but there's um there's some good news on that front if, if I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, there was uh, they, a Kickstarter, yes. Yep, recently. yep, and landing this year or kickstarted this year is the Journey's End expansion, which is going to, amongst everything else, include to address people's concerns. I've not followed it too much, but uh, that's that's very very good to know. Uh, but as it stands, the the base game and the, the second edition one that I that I own is very much a solo game in spirit that you can enjoy with some friends. Uh, overall, I think it's one of the best solo games. The feeling of exploration is great and the mechanics are just really interesting. It feels really fleshed out. It's not the kind of game that you can uh, bring alongside with you while you go on vacation because it's quite big and it's, it's maybe a little bit too uh, intensive for that, for that kind of stuff. It's not the, the kind of the game you grab in your bag. But uh, as a solo game, it's it's really it's stellar, and I would recommend anybody interested with a solo game or, or uh, cooperative games to to grab it. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Fen, you played a lot of it, right? I've played a reasonable amount of it. Yeah, I've got even got one. Of, I've played a reasonable amount of it. Yeah, I've got even got one of the expansions which I managed to get my hands on, the oh. Nautilus Upgrades expansion pack, which just gives you some more options on how to upgrade the nautilus yeah uh first of all i, I just gotta say you know tools art is fantastic it always is but it's really good and you can definitely see that he had a, it always is but it's really good and you can definitely see that he had a hand in helping make the second edition legible and, and easier to follow and also i super appreciate that they that the artwork shows the captain nemo uh, clearly of East Indian descent, because that's who he was. Uh, Indian descent, because that's who he was uh, revealed to be. You know, he's very mysterious in the first book, but in Mysterious Island, uh, he's said to be the son of an East Indian Raj. Yeah. So it's great <laughs> that they've kept that in there, and I, I love the anti-colonialism in this. Um, I, I anything that allows me to let us also remember that the first two were characterized uh, correctly at the fiction of Captain Nemo was Alan Moore with the League of, of Extraordinary Gentlemen, where he was clearly of East Indian descent. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was just a historical note. I played the uh, played the uh, Nemo War just the the first edition on a tabletop simulator mod, which is not uh, online anymore because I failed to get the print. So I'll probably get a late pledge or. Uh, Game Steward pledge pro for this uh, new edition because I, I've always been interested, been interested in Nemo's War. So that's all I can contribute to it. For now. Well, the second edition is available for purchase at the moment. The Kickstarter was um, to add some extra stuff, I believe, or maybe reprint it. Yep. 
but I've, uh, I've had I think this it was sort of print stuff and they added like those uh, I think that they added all of these I'm not sure that I would need yeah. to check yeah I was checking the levels it, it looks like that uh, I'm not expert in that so I cannot be completely sure but about expansion what do you recommend about that um well, the expansions are all sort of, uh, sort of um, smallish. They add new upgrades, they add new adventures, and I think that one of them adds new character. I would need to, to look at it because I, I had the game with the expansion immediately, so I didn't play it without them. Uh, but yeah. from what I've seen, it's just more content. If you it, already it like uh, Mimus Wall, you just have a little bit more of it. Yeah, they're all very small. Um, one of them adds like two adventure cards. It's called Holidays on the High Seas. Uh, it's just very fluffy. Um, one of them's Dramatis Personnel, which gives you like 10 additional cards. There's a, a nine new adventure cards and a, a finale card. The new finale is probably the biggest. Ew, like gives. Uh, I've not played with it, so I don't really want to sit here and just read the text off. Um, now I think about it, but and then there's the one I have, which is the Nautilus upgrades, which is all of them are kind of not really needed, that but which is good. That's what they should be like. But I do think maybe this Journey's End one is going to be desirable for people who want to play this two player. Cool. So. Yeah, a very, very good game. It's just super clever. Uh, I really enjoy the fact that all of the ships are um, historical ships, uh, if I remember correctly. And the way that they ratchet up the pressure, where you kind of feel like, oh, it's all right. The way that they ratchet up the pressure, where you kind of feel like, oh, it's all right, it's all right. And then suddenly around the third act, you just it's, it's all heck has broken loose. And you've really got to push hard. And uh, especially if you're not playing like a war, um, orientated Captain Nemo. It can be very sort of like, ah, oh, the ships are building up, but I'm like, ah, oh, the ships are building up, but I'm not really interested in that. That's not yeah. what I'm wanting to do, but I kind of have to manage this. Yeah, um, managing the different, uh, basically pressure that's that's coming as the game goes on is is very important, and I think very clever in the way that it, uh, it does. How it goes, how it goes. Yeah, it's a very smart game. The one thing that I've always felt was a little bit disappointing, and maybe maybe you'll have a different opinion there, uh, is that at the end of the game, you have a score, and you basically need to um, compare your score with a, a thing that tells you uh, how well you can still technically lose if you get to the end, but just don't have a good enough score because you 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 didn't uh, focus on your objective enough. I. I feel for a solo game, it's always needed, but it always feels a bit uh, disappointing. That's the, the way that it's handled. Um, but I think that the journey to the end is what, what, what makes the game fun. So, Yeah, yeah, that's what I think as well. I mean, you've got a gigantic book of epilogues and, you know, they got uh, yeah. defeat, failure and inconsequential and success and triumph as your different options for each one. They have a gigantic, rather nice illustration, you know, um, sketched sort of one. They have a gigantic, rather nice illustration, you know, um, sketched sort of crosshatch style that fits the theme of book the, the books of the time. Um, it, it's fine. It's I I think with Nebo's War, it's very much more the journey that makes the big the big impact. The big the big impact and you just have something there at the end to gauge this is how well i've done um and really let's face it this is the kind of game where in truth you're just trying to do better than you did last time you'd be like okay i'm gonna play i'm gonna play explore again and i'm gonna score better than i did previously i, I they don't really bother me too much they could have just not been there but it is something to focus on it adds a little to to the story and the character um all right. Well, a wonderful game for for people to to focus on. Mm, yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um, what, a very good solo game. I think we did bring it yeah, up. I, remember, yeah. I think it was so, somewhere above the the thirty uh the top thirty. Um, it, I remember it being relatively high. I can't remember exactly when. And I have I, I failed in my research to find the exact number because I forgot until we started recording to check. But um, from <laughs> under the ocean, we're now going to move on top of the Scandinavian Phillips, uh, a name who we did talk about in the previous podcast as well. So yeah. 
I'm talking about this because I actually want to talk about the West, West Kingdom trilogy, but uh-huh. I don't think I can do that without talking about the North Sea trilogy. So Your second favorite cameo point. Mm, so, <laughs> basi- cameo point. Mm, so <laughs> basically this is part of what I've been calling the Windrose trilogy because it's compass points and the North Sea is the first trilogy and then the um, sorry, did I say Quadrology, sorry, the Windrose Quadrology. So the North Sea is the first Windrose Quadrology. So the North Sea is the first um, like point on the compass, and the West Kingdom is the second point. And it's been announced that we're going to see South Tigris for the third, and then um, there's going to be East for the fourth. So every single one of these is three games, sometimes with expansions. Uh, is three games, sometimes with expansions. Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. Each one of these is three games with a, then like a, uh, a an overarching mini game stuck on top if you want to play all of them. Um, and the North Sea is sort of the first lot. Now, I'm I'm, I'm not going to talk in mass lot. Now, I'm I'm, I'm not going to talk in massive detail about all three. Uh, and there's going to be a reason for that. But um, first one up is Shipwrights of the North Sea. And this is a card drafting game where you are constructing ships you have a little player board there's a deck of cards in the middle player board there's a deck of cards in the middle you and everyone will like draw from a number that have been picked draft from a number that have been drawn even um and go around the table it's it's not great to be honest it's okay it's fine but there are better drafting games and the biggest problem is the way the drafting system is is operated and everyone's drafting from one card and so is a one one pack so as a consequence if you're the last person picking you sometimes have to take a card that does nothing to help your strategy whatsoever which is not great um yeah yeah Con- considering that's all that's about uh, it's it's something which makes everything strategic and compelling so it's a pretty big downside this one yeah it's a it's quite an issue so people house rule the drafting in various different ways i mean there's been a lot of different draft methods that have been put out there uh just to solve this by adding in the townsfolk expansion as a, a permanent thing it gives players extra options that they can do stuff with by visiting this townsfolk board and doing things it helps a bit but ultimately this is it's clearly a, a, a game from a relatively inexperienced designer at the time and uh, for the fact that I'm reviewing it and the fact that it's part of the Rune Saga. So it's fine. Um, I'd say like it's between a 6 and a 7 out of 10 as games go. Like it's not like you're going to hate it, but you might feel frustrated at times and not feel like you're doing anything, which is one of the worst experiences in a board game. Then I'm going to think you just for a second, but I just re- received my uh, my confirmation of shipment for Caraquest. So this is happening. Ooh, right now. Okay. Yeah, right now. Now you've tied. Now. Mm. Uh, um, yeah. Now, yes, now you've sorry. now you've really time stamped the recording, haven't you? Stamped the recording, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, now, now believe this. So uh, now I'm, I'm going to jump past the second game and go to the third game which is Explorers of the North Sea, and it has an expansion called Rocks of Ruin. It's a pick-up-and-deliver game where you also do tile laying, and it's kind of cute. It's a pick-up-and-deliver game where you also do tile laying, and it's kind of cute. Uh, you, you'll like pick from a number of hexagonal tiles, and you'll build up this little seascape. You have to follow rules to construct the islands correctly. You'll populate the islands with various animals and maybe settlements, and you'll also be controlling a boat and some Viking pulling a boat, and some Vikings that you're going out, you're collecting the animals, taking them back to the mainland, which is a set collecting game. You want different varied animals, not all the same, because Vikings don't care about breeding their animals. They care about putting them on show and going, this is my cow, this is my pig, Uh this is my chicken, this is my goose, this is my donkey, this is my wife. uh, Of this game. Way more than the shipwright one. Yeah, it it looks nice. And it's it's kind of fun to play. Um, It's very tight. So you are at this point where um, you have to be very careful. You've got a limited number of actions. You have to think about what you're doing. And also when you get other players are messing with you by screwing up the islands you're trying to complete, because there's points for 
uh, settling an island, but you can only do that if the island is fully uh, complete on the board. So it's sort of got a bit of that going on. There's points of conquering settlements, and you'll have a character who specific certain things. Um, it's fine. It, it is fine. Uh, and again, it's not super, super exciting, but I think it's a better time than shipwrights. And the Rocks of Ruin expansion adds more stuff and definitely improves it, um, which is a bit a little tough to be like, yeah, Explorers is OK. If you get to be like, yeah, Explorers is OK. If you get Rocks of Ruin, it's a lot better. Um, but again, it's not not the exciting part of this trilogy. So the exciting part, oddly, is of the middle one. Of course you really like the part where uh, you get to uh, steal stuff from the English. Where uh, you get to uh, steal stuff from the English. <laughs> um, it, it's it's not really clear who you are, but yeah, maybe maybe it is the English. I guess it's the North Sea. Yeah, you're right. Raiders of the North Sea. You, so, you really appropriate stuff. I, 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 no, no, this is a Scandinavians appropriating. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, so Raiders of the North Sea is the... Raiders of the North Sea is the worker placement game of the trilogy. And it's got some really interesting mechanics. Now, there is an app version of this. It only contains the core game. The app is pretty well done. It's got a fun little campaign that mixes the rules up and changes how everything's playing. So I can recommend that. It's on Steam. You've got a worker placement board at the bottom half. And at the top, you've got another worker placement board. But you're going to be attacking those spots. So on your turn... It's very simple. You take one of your work, your worker, sorry, your one little Viking worker, and you put them on one of the empty spaces on the board and you do the thing. Classic worker placement off that space and you do the thing. So the board again cunningly like locks off combos. Uh, At any given time, half of the things are occupied and half of them aren't. So you've got to figure out it's like, oh, well, I really want to uh, get some money to recruit. But I can't get money to recruit and recruit in the same route and recruit in the same turn because both those spaces are empty. So I'm going to have to find something else to do. It reduces um, player decision space in an interesting manner. It forces you to be creative. And it also gets rid of, you know, that phase where it's like, and now it's time to have everyone to pick up all their workers off the board at the end of the round. No, because they're constantly at the end of the round. No, because they're constantly cycling and you're only ever like picking one worker to go to one place to do one thing. That's quite good. It is. It's very That's good. Smart, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's even more stuff with the workers. We'll talk about it in a moment. But the other half of like the village section uh, section um, is your cards. So cards represent like crew members, people in the village, and you've got two things you can do with them. You can either go and you, you've got to draw them from one location on the board. You'll have a few to start with. And you can either spend money to recruit them to your ship so they can go out raiding ability when they're a member of your crew. Or you can go to one place where you use them for their ability and you just discard them and get the ability. For example, the gate guard lets you draw three new cards, which is better than visiting the gate where you'd normally only get two cards. You know, you, you can filter away the gate guard and get a replacement plus two more. Even if the location, the gate guards like have different things they do, like the grave digger, he's rubbish at raiding. He's got zero strength. He's like garbage at it. I, I just received the package. I'll be right back. Okay. We'll continue. Yep. So the, the, um, Gravedigger is like garbage at raiding, uh, but you want to send him out there because if he dies, you get a piece of gold, and gold's like a very rare, valuable resource that very rare, valuable resource that you can do stuff with. And that's the other, like the rest of the board at the top section has all these locations, and they're harbors and monasteries and fortresses, and you can't go out and raid them unless you have the uh, sufficient characters in your boat, sufficient characters in your boat, and enough provisions for the journey. And each location will vary. So one location might want three people, one provision, and another will be like, two people's fine, but you need three provisions for this. Or even further up, you have to spend gold to get to those locations. And when you attack them, you'll take resources from you'll take resources from a little worker placement location that you put your worker in. Um, and then that worker token is lost. And instead you take the worker token that's in the space for your next turn. And these are different colors. So you might go to a place and you go, all right, I get a cow, a rock, a gold, one a cow, a rock, a gold. One of my Vikings dies. 
and I get a silver worker. And the Death Viking's great. You have to discard one of your cards from your raid. Uh, they're gone. And like the Gravedigger might trigger an ability, but they're also worth points at the end of the game. Like Vikings like to go to Valhalla and everyone celebrates that. Woo! Valhalla and everyone celebrates that. Woo! Um, yeah. I, I played the version I used to say Valhalla and the fact that the worker uh, moves and takes two actions is the best part of the game. Yeah, it's it's really clever in that you spend the time building up this crew and then you look at the look yeah, it's it's really clever in that you spend the time building up this crew and then you look at the locations, you go, Okay, well I go there and some of my guys are gonna die. No matter how strong they are at fighting, they're going to die. So I wanna think about who I'm losing. And there's even some characters who they're terrible at fighting, but you want them for the end of the game. So the game. So you're like, okay, well, when do I put this one on my in my crew to get the bonus at the end of the game? And when do I just kind of like hold on to it? Or should I just sacrifice that person and be fine with it? Um, but yeah, you'll come back from the raid and you'll have this new different worker, like a silver one, or maybe a white one. Different worker, like a silver one, or maybe a white one. I came and... back from the raid. Mm, <laughs> yes, indeed. You come back with a package. Brilliant. Uh, and so you've got all your... <laughs> your resources that you brought back with the raid cows and all of that kind of stuff and gold and you can trade those in for points at the longhouse and, and points points at the longhouse and, and points mean prizes um but also the workers now have a different value in some of the locations you you got, can't go to some spaces without having a silver or a white and in other spaces you get bonuses for putting a silver or white there or you get worse like or you get worse like silver and white workers generate less money than black ones so gradually the game sort of changes to this position where you're like okay well if i put this worker down here this makes this location not as good and that's fine by me maybe no one will pick it and then i can grab that worker again and i can go further up the board towards the fortresses where i need interesting how you start off not really doing much kind of floundering a little bit around like oh this feels very slow and then suddenly everything's going you've got combos running and it's really just super interesting so i i like it i think as a worker placement game it does a good job of cutting like prices of like trading resources trading your crew for victory points but then you need to rebuild your crew for the next thing and i haven't even covered because i'm trying to be relatively brief um uh, all sorts of interesting things like you attack the bigger places further up and you if you get a certain amount of two expansions um i've only played a bit with the one that gives like there's a board sits on the side and gives you access to attacking some yarls or something some like chieftain type characters and you can i think defeat them or recruit them um and then there's another board that sits at the bottom and sits at the bottom and provides a mead house and it gives you extra places to recruit more people by charming them and they might arrive with some resources and it can give you quests so you go back to a place that's already been raided and do more stuff so they're great and honestly it's like the gem of this trilogy it's definitely of this trilogy it's definitely the best one. It's the meatiest game. It's a good worker placement game. It stands on its own really nicely. Um, unfortunately, the box that I got with all the expansions in is a different size to all the other boxes. So <laughs> putting it on the shelf is a bit of a mess. <laughs> um, and then just to wrap it up, you can get Rune Saga, which is it adds like a bunch of runes to each of the games. You play them in order. So you'll play shipwrights and there'll be these runes for extra objectives. You achieve them, you get the runes. You win, you get a rune. You you closely come second place, you get a rune. Uh, they might give you bonuses. In, it feels fine. Uh, then you'll play raiders, you'll do the same. Then you'll play explorers at the end as a nice little capper for the evening. And boom, person with the most runes is the winner, which is cool. That's very interesting that you can play the game and have more, um, like th that all three games. Yeah, they, they thematically fit together. The artwork is wonderful. Uh, it's like just such a such a good piece. Uh, there's even um, in the Rune Saga, uh, I got given a bunch of um, like postcards and there's a picture of Shem as a Viking and one of um, oh, Mihalio. 
Dimitrescu. I my pronunciation is terrible, as usual. I deliberately butcher things these days, or at least I, that's what I pretend. But um, I I love his art. I, I love like I I often talk about how great Ian O'Toole's art is, but I think the biggest draw for me on this draw for me on this entire series is how good and evocative the artwork is. So that is the North Sea trilogy. Um, and I think it's, I think it's not something you really need, but Raiders is so good that you might get it so good that you might get it, play it and be like, Ooh, actually I wouldn't mind having the other two games to, to have as a whole evening. And it works because the, uh, shipwrights is light enough as a starter that it doesn't take too long to get through and explorers is it, there's not a huge like thinky game in any of these three so with three different styles of games so that's the north sea trilogy uh, alexis celestio do you have anything you'd like to say about it well i've never played it so i i wouldn't know what you start talking about it but it sounds very interesting i especially like the fact that you can combine all three games for a full evening and making boats and forging uh, that sounds like a good uh, a good time with the yeah. uh, the Viking games. It, it does. I I played uh, quite a bit of Raiders from the North Sea because my brother w- wouldn't would not just shut up about it because North Sea because my brother w- wouldn't would not just shut up about it because he loved the game and uh, well I. Um, I have a kind of an ambivalence with the worker placement games because worker placement is kind of a boring mechanic in the fact that he he loved the game. And, uh, well, I I have a kind of an ambivalence with the worker placement games because worker placement is kind of a boring mechanic in the fact that it's adopted by basically every game. There are great games with worker placement and there are bad games with in the fact that it's adopted by basically every game. There are great games with worker placement and there are bad games with worker placement. Uh, Riders of the North Sea is a peculiar worker placement because it would be entirely forgettable if it wasn't for uh, picking up the worker and uh, doing both the action from it from where it comes from and where you are going to place it. That is all the difference. Uh, After playing a lot of it, I can say that it will probably won't stay uh, actual 50 games, but it's a very interesting twist and it's a game you you should play because uh, after a lot of uh, games, you still think, wow, Riders of the North Sea, well, why not? When there's a new player, you will introduce them to eventually try to build a strong crew. You can try to, to go and plunder, or if you don't want to go raiding, you can just uh, <laughs> pick the weaklings and just send them to Malala. And both strategies are valid, pursuable, and even interchangeable. So it's a when worker placement uh, was still quite boring, so it, it is very good, very good for the time, and it stands to the best of time right now. Wonderful. Right, so you're simultaneously not recommending it and recommending it. <laughs> yeah, because it's a worker placement, so it's simultaneously good, and so it's simultaneously good, and simultaneously well, it will be been there. I think it's a very different worker placement style from anything else. Uh, yeah, I, and I think a lot of worker placement games don't have ask you to if you place here, you need to sacrifice a load of your resources. Would you say that it's... here you need to sacrifice a load of your resources? Would you say that it's very different from Agricola? Oh, Agricola, <laughs> Agricola. It's very different from a hungry cola. Yeah, <laughs> it's more forgiving, it's more enjoyable, and it's uh, it's more pleasant. Uh, although I have played more. Um, you know, uh, although I have played more, um, you know, more games of Angry Koala than I have of of a Hungry Cola drinker. Yeah. Um, right. Well, that is that for now. But I will be coming back to this series with the West Kingdom stuff in an episode or two's episode or two's time, because 
oh my goodness now that is a trilogy of uh well two worker placement and one rondel ish game that really just they, they, they were all in the solo players list and yes they are fantastic but from uh, you know we're going to uh now to driven return of the milton bradley games workshop classic designed by stephen baker and it's always worth noting that the best thing about this podcast is hero quest <laughs> so before yeah. i yeah before i hand it across to alessio i do want to briefly just talk a bit about the genetics of this board game. massive impact so if you go back in time through board games eventually you reach um dungeons and dragons chainmail which is kind of like the, the it, it's sort of a board gamey war gamey style thing and it's very much i feel the progenitor of this genre the um, box. Yes. Now, obviously, Dungeons and Dragons go in games, and that's a huge, big, massively important field that has just become bigger and bigger and more and more in pop culture, uh, uh, thanks to things like Critical Role. Um, but there's also this little sideline that goes off, and you get um, these. I think it's a Swedish game, uh, which is known as Dungeon Quest in English, uh, which is known as Dungeon Quest in English. Games Workshop published it, and then in 19. 19- 89 um the the in the uk all of a sudden everything apparently goes crazy and there's this nuts like insane advert and kids are buying and taken to kids are buying and taken to school and playing with their friends hero quest which is the first of these dungeon crawls and this is what we're going to be talking about because the reprint is pretty faithful um but hero quest spawned advanced hero quest from games workshop where they kind of tried to games workshop a fight which was a big success and even to this date people still play original warhammer quest and love it it's i do yeah it's it's a rough game um in some ways but it's really enjoyable however warhammer quest like uh, then spawned a load of other games and we have stuff like shadows of incredibly good um blackstone fortress uh, uh and all we Mm-hmm. There was also the Dungeon and Dragons, the fantasy adventure board game from 2003 uh, mm-hmm. that I played when I was a lot younger, and uh, that that was the version of Hero Quest that I knew. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's uh, and of course this is when I was trying to this is when I was trying to get to though the the big one is that the entire complex AI boss battle in genre owes its existence to Warhammer Quest because Kingdom Death is created by somebody who was very clearly a fan of Warhammer Quest and played it a great deal, so much so that he baked like direct Warhammer Quest, so much so that he baked like direct Warhammer Quest mechanics and references into the game. So without Warhammer Quest, we wouldn't have Kingdom Death. Without Kingdom Death, we wouldn't have Oathsworn or Sankakushin or Townsfolk Tussle. Uh, you know, it's like, woof. This is that big, and that's even without that big, and that's even without considering when you go back to Hero Quest, then you spin forward a bit in time. You get to this man called Kevin Wilson, who looked at Hero Quest and went, "I can do this," and he made Descent First Edition, which is very clearly a better version of Hero Quest for the a modern crowd, with some fairer mechan- with some fairer mechanics and less like terrifying stuff, and. Uh, you thousands know, of tokens. Yes, thousands of tokens and, and all yeah. sorts of bonkers stuff. And uh, thanks to Descent, we now have games like Midara and um, uh, glu- uh, d- yeah. D- thanks to Descent, we have Descent. Yeah. D- thanks to Descent, we have Descent. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> I, yeah. I was going to say Gloomhaven, very much like has that more feet. It's definitely from the Descent family, although it's skewed off and gone and mated with a Euro game to give you this new kind of thing again, which nothing else is quite like Gloomhaven. Nothing else is quite like Gloomhaven. So we got these all these families, but it all pans back to this one. And well, what can we say? Back in 2020, on Hasbro Pulse, there was announced, hey, we're going to be doing a reprint of Hero Quest. Doing a reprint of Hero Quest. And first of all, you have to be in America to get your hands on it, which uh, this is a British game, and the British people were very upset about that. Um, but thanks to some kind Americans, I've got a copy. 
and I believe same with you, uh, Alessio. Yeah. yeah. Um, same with uh, you, Alessio. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, three point seven million dollars was pledged to bring this game back to life, and here it is. So, Alessio, take it away. Okay. So uh, basically, what Penn did was to remove uh, like seven minutes of my of my own intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I was planning to do the same. I'll just add a, a couple of notes to that. Uh, Hero Quest was basically at the beginning of the life of Games Workshop. Uh, actually, not really at the beginning because they had uh, uh, cool games, in, cool games in place uh, back then. But it was an attempt to make the uh, relatively fresh universe of uh, Warhammer Fantasy to the to, to, to mainstream. They made an agreement with Lipton Bradley, and the the, the fact that uh, that uh, Hasbro is now making it is just because they bought Milton Bradley. Uh, the IP was uh, sleeping there for a lot of time during the 25th anniversary, which is basically five six years ago since we are in 2022 clearly. Uh, tried to get the trademark of the game which was available in uh, Europe but of course not uh, uh, under US law because that uh, was still the property of Hasbro and they tried to make a game which was very 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 similar to Eurofest did never deliver actually I followed the I followed the game for a while being hopeful but uh, it was basically never published it never delivered and uh, since Hasbro noticed from there that the game was actually stated to, well, since we cannot use Game Workshop's IP because uh, the, 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 the old world is their copyright, and uh, since uh, we won't for sure never return the IP to them because, uh, to them because uh, we want to. Uh, we want actually to make money out of it. They decide. They, they finally decided to remove the old world from HeroQuest and make it a generic fantasy game, which is the current edition we have now. Uh, basically, uh, basically, uh, this is a difficult thing to talk about because uh, uh, mostly two things. Uh, first is that everyone knows HeroQuest. The best thing about HeroQuest is uh, actually that it's uh, available because uh, <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone knows HeroQuest, everyone knows uh, uh, how, it, how it plays. So it, you basically have a fixed board with rooms where you can place furniture and doors and the dungeon changes because you basically close and open corridors, uh, close and open doors, uh, put secret doors and traps and stuff. And you go and fight. You roll dice to move. You roll dice to attack. To attack. You roll dice to defend. And you have equipment in the form of cards for a very very simple game. You have a quest with an objective. You usually go into the quest, uh, go through the objective, fulfill the objective, which is usually kill something, but could be find something or return back or activate or activate something uh, and go away and. That's basically it. The, the, the game is both uh, de delightfully simple and delightfully entertaining uh, because you can make thousands of quests. Uh, Advanced Hero Quest was made basically for that because, because uh, basically allowed to make, uh, to, to extend the game indefinitely. There were a lot of uh, games and resources uh, uh, and websites uh, which made you create your own uh, equipment and pages and quests and quest line and stuff uh, that turned out to be saved. Unfortunately, uh, most of them were uh, destroyed by Games Workshop back then when they basically decided in the early 2000s to protect their IPs. And they, they, they are most... taking a little bit too much uh, inspiration from their own uh, full, uh, 40k uh, <laughs> yeah. <more. laughs> yeah. destroy the technology. <laughs> Suffer not the Xenopolis. 
So there, there was there was definitely a really dark period in Games Workshop around the, the start of the millennium. Yeah, and luckily uh, that uh, that uh, beautiful tradition has been continued by Hasbro because uh, the the couple last of historical uh, website I used to refer uh, I talked about Hero Quest were accessed just before uh, Bulls campaign. Uh, I, I'm sad about that because uh, I. Don't even remember the names of of some of them because I had uh, the bookmark and the bookmark was bookmark was invalid, so it didn't get refreshed. And uh, they are basically uh, hundred and hundred of hours so people uh, across the world were just lost to protect the IP. So basically, what we have now it's uh, EroQuest, exactly the same game with without without the old world references, which is manufactured by Hasbro. It has new miniatures and new stuff, which is PVC, and there's a couple of things to say about this. And uh, it's basically a toy, which is also a cool board game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very faithful to the original. So I think for, for the listener, my own personal connection with Hero Quest comes like way after its release because it was bought by my grandparents for my older cousins to play and then I was the grandchild who actually spent my most most time with those I that's why I wanted it is it reminds me of spending time with my grandparents and I'm really happy with the fact that they modernized it but kept the original look of the box and the art like it's new art but it's the same um, scene. It's the same scene, which and that scene is. It's the same scene, which and that scene is iconic with the barbarian at the front and all the other characters at the back. Um, and, and so, when it comes to nostalgia, that's I think what's driven so much of this. I'll put my hand up and say I bought it for nostalgia, but it's not for nostalgia of the game for me. It's for nostalgia of my childhood and family members who are no longer and family members who are no longer with me. So that's the same reason I keep Dungeon Quest. Um, around uh i i will say but the like i i do think they missed a couple of tricks with this i like that they kept the original system but i do think they could have updated do think they could have updated it by including a modern set of rules to just fix some of the most frustrating parts of the game while also having a classic rules book for those people who like i want to play hero quest because the best thing about hero quest is the rule book um so i i I, so i i i I feel frustrated that they have didn't touch movement in particular because it's so unbelievably one-sided like the heroes move with monopoly dice and yeah, it, it is. It's like you sit there at the start of your turn and you have a plan. And the fact is that you have to have contingency plans because is that you have to have contingency plans because maybe three of the characters do exactly what the players wanted them to do. And the third one goes, well, I've tripped over my feet and I can move two spaces. So what you were hoping I would do for you, I can't do. And now there's a load of mummies coming our way and I was meant to stop them. Sorry, have fun. So it, it, it will take you five turns to get it, it will take you five turns to get there instead of one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it kind of encourages this dirdling style of play where you, you you're like, oh, if I've rolled really well, maybe I shouldn't use all of my movement because I don't know if everyone's going to be able to keep up with me. So I wouldn't mind a version that removed a bit of the randomness from the movement, maybe by giving the removed a bit of the randomness from the movement, maybe by giving them a set move value and then you roll d6 for extra. So you can always be like, well, I know the dwarf moves at least three spaces a turn. So that's my first criticism is I, I think a bit of modernization with an alternative rule set would have been nice. And the same with defense, because uh, this Zargon player who was ruthless, it's the same thing that happens in any kind of one versus many or many versus many like hero type game where the horde picks one target and gangs them and goes, you're you're done for, you're going to die. And then when that character dies, that player has to sit it out. Descent dealt with it. It worked. And so the app, if you play co-op, doesn't do that. It doesn't gang up on one character. And I like that. I was like, that's a, that's good. That It's not like picking the same character for everyone to run at. Um, it's spreading out the attacks a bit. That feels softer. But against a human player, it can be ruthless. And 
effect to that because with one player less uh, you do uh, one fourth of your damage less and so uh, as you as the game goes on it can get really you can get into a really t- a tight spot where you yeah. clearly cannot win it compounds onto the movement issue that like if you roll badly and out of position then suddenly the wizard can get janked by someone who goes you what have you what have how much body right you're dead right now you're dead this turn forget about it and the you know that's like that sucks which can you go buy some uh some pizza we'll be there for a while <laughs> yeah yeah um so i also very briefly want to say why does the elf have boob plate a with the female elf and i like the fey design with the long hair and the like very attractiveness because in the male version it's just the same very anime looking and like an earth little. but why does the female version have to have a boob plate boob plates useless they you you have to which well, she goes every morning she goes right well i'm gonna pour one of my breasts into the left cup and one of my breasts into the right cup she's like why she's obviously even if she had very large breasts they'd be bound and then leather on top and chainmail on top of that there's just empty air inside those cups so no more boob plate in fantasy games artists designers don't do it although now i've criticized i'll say thank you for giving us female versions and thank you for the additional characters they're really cool yeah that's uh that's a good addition to to the game to modernize it a little bit yeah that was basically the best thing about hero quest is the mythic tier box definitely everything cool about the the, the new release uh, is in the box you have three new heroes. You have the Bard, the Warlock, and the Druid. I played uh, briefly with uh, all of them because I'm playing with the kids, uh, perpetuating tra- the tradition of playing Hero Quest with your dead. And, uh, and yes, the heroes are tradition of playing Hero Quest with your dead. And, uh, and yes, the heroes are all feasible. They make the game probably simpler because I remember as a kid to die basically all the time in all the quests uh, as the dwarf, because uh, as a kid to die basically all the time in all the quests uh, as the dwarf, because uh, the the game was simply like that, Uh, you roll bad, uh, you die. That that and the dwarf is like the bottom rung of like all the characters. What does the dwarf do? Well, he's a bad barbarian, or he's like the elf, but he can't cast spells. Barbarian, or he's like the elf, but he can't cast spells. It's a a barbarian which uh, survives after the first mind damage. That's the, the the only usefulness of the dwarf. So... Actually, replacing the dwarf with the warlock is a lot of an asset. Uh, replacing the dwarf a lot of new options. The spells are all cool. And uh, the warlock, I think, could be OP. But basically, we are still talking about the toy because it's a toy which is also a board game. Mm. So uh, it's not that important to be balanced about that. The, the, the important part is that the game has to be fun. Yeah, particularly like, important about my comments on modernizing the game they're they're all clearly modern designs because every single one of them um has a spell that can get refreshed the bard the bard has like here you get some additional like uh attack dice i think it is courage and that's a really cool spell it's uh, but then, when, uh, but then, whenever anyone rolls two white shields in defense, the, and he, if he sees them do that, it refreshes a spell. And the druid has a shapeshift spell that makes her tougher until she's injured. And then I think whenever she heals back up to full, that spell refreshes. And there's one for the warlock. I can't remember what the warlock does. But all of them, I was like, these are really cool, and these characters feel. Them, I was like, these are really cool, and these characters feel way more powerful than the core game ones. Yeah, they they do, and you can swap them in and out, and we will probably talk about this because uh, there's the app is not the best thing about the request. Mm. <laughs> but here we yeah, talk about this in a in a moment because we will I, do about the request. Mm. <laughs> but here we yeah, talk about this in a in a moment because we will I, do. Yeah, I also want to say that the extra miniature sounds are pretty much unneeded. Because the, you have a lot. Uh, How people. very dare you! There's Lady Dark Warriors in there, <laughs> and they don't have individual breast pockets. No, I second that warrior. 
I d- uh, that gargoyle's for Kellar's Keep. That's a specific named gargoyle, just like yeah. the other one is is the Witch King or Witch Queen. I can't remember. There's there's a witch specific God. Witch Lord. Yeah, so they're, they're specific, which is cool. They did like specific models for those. But I think you've forgotten that you two can also play thanks to the Mythic tier. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have you have three wizard models, and you don't even have enough cards to play three wizards. I was like, it'd be kind of funny to to roll three wizards and just be like, well, we've got got uh you've got like all these spells and that's it could we have a barbarian in front to take all the hits please thank you very much um yeah so um yeah so it's a bit like all right but that reminds me of one of the things that really frustrated me is the equipment cards make no sense okay so so you have you have a deck of equipment cards and they're very clean and they're clear and the whole point is they're meant to be a reference you write in your character sheet what the whole point is they're meant to be a reference you write in your character sheet what you have and then you have the card as a reference but there's not one of each card sometimes there's one card sometimes there's two sometimes there's three there's like two daggers um there's three helmets and there's one short sword and both the dwarf and the elf start with a short sword <laughs> now in the british ver- short sword now in the british version that came out the characters didn't have weapons to start they just had like their base attack stat and it was assumed that they already had the weapon but this is based on the american version so i'm just like couldn't you have given either like one of each and just be like, okay, you copy them and write what you need on your character sheet, or given you need on your character sheet, or given four of each, so players could have their cards representing. This kind of half-assed sort of thing is like, I, I, I very annoying because I wasted ten minutes at the start when I first opened it up, going, well, I've got the elf and I've got the dwarf, and there's only one short sword card. Why is there only one short sword card? Is there only one short sword card. <laughs> I was just like, like so. I, so I ended up throwing the dwarf to one side and going, okay, well, I'm going to play with the warlock. Oh, she needs a dagger. Oh no, that's the same problem. No, wait a minute. There's a second dagger card. Brilliant. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so anyway, anyway yeah. the really cool part about the mythic tier pledge, the really cool part about the mythic tier pledge is the is the new quest lines. You have three booklets of stuff, and then you have ready to. I actually, I'm kind of cheating here because I just began checking the Prophecy of Taylor and I had a quick yellow because the, I keep forgetting that German Gamello is actually very, very legit. He's a lot of stuff. He's a, he's a, he's a good master. <laughs> the, it, I, it's a classic clock and dungeon adventure, but it begins in a tavern and it ends in a dragon slayer. So it's from the looks of it, it appears extremely difficult because I saw a kind of a number of monsters on the latest pages, uh, which are alarming. And uh, all these three quest lines justify buying the mid tier. Also play through the quest lines. Yeah, well, it's not hero quest if you don't have one quest line that's like, how do we even get anywhere? These monsters are too hard. It used to be against the Ogre Horde, where it was yeah. absurd. But the uh, European yeah. expansion, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. The the one that uh, that when my grandparents passed away, crash pile somewhere out in the UK. So how about that, eh? That's fun, considering how much yeah. those things sell for. Uh, so yeah, it's um I am played them yet and i've like not wanted to look at them for not wanting to spoil them if i do decide i want to play them um but i do think it's nice that there's extra and they're not yeah. not listed yeah. as coming soon that, there's no mythic tier stuff in the app and there's yeah. no expansion it, there, there is the characters are yeah. in the app yeah which is yeah. weird yeah 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 um i i wanted to say as well uh, because we we are a bit short on time, I think there's no expansion. It, there, there is the characters are yeah. in the app, yeah, which is yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I wanted to say as well, uh, because we we are a bit short on time. I think the storage situation with Hero Quest is, is terrible. Yeah, uh, it is both is both good and bad. I I wanted to say as well. Uh, because we we are a bit short on time, I think the storage situation with Hero Quest is, is terrible. Yeah, uh, it is both is both good and bad at the same time, but it leans on the 
I, I, I'm surprised you found something good about it because like they have this extra large box. With... I'm surprised you found something good about it because like they have this extra large box with a cardboard lift in it, and I was like, cool, that's room for the mythic tier. And then you put the mythic tier in, and you put the other two trays on top, and now the box doesn't close properly. And I was like, well, exactly. what am I? What am I supposed to do uh, if I take the mythic tier stuff out of the insert, out, out of the cardboard box it comes in, and put it in the bottom, or that the individual pieces? Um, that like there's a chance of breaking them when they come out. That was frustrating to me. That's yeah. quite frustrating indeed. So yeah, yeah. They're, they're really tight. In in the original Ego Quest, wasn't um like all of the the scenery uh like cardboard and now it's all yeah. solid plastic. That part, the furnishing was part cardboard and part plastic, like the sand is now. Uh, but the new version is just PVC and an endless horde of PVC, which is, uh, I think it's pretty unneeded. So uh, that that's basically it. That, that, that's, uh, uh, you have, mm, the, the, the box is uh, a lot larger than the original box. So you'd say, but well, at least I can put everything in it. Actually not, if you want to keep the separate separator, the, the extrusion uh, which keeps the miniatures in place, which is kind of cool, you have to leave the expansion box outside of the main box. So yeah, that, that's the terrible part. The good part is the fact that the miniatures, uh, differently from the original EuroQuest, they stay, they stay in place in this box. Yeah, yeah, the models are definitely one of the the good things, but uh, I, 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 mine, some of mine were very badly damaged when they arrived, so that's fun. Yeah, I had the the, the bottom box was basically destroyed. I just uh, the cardboard uh, mini box that was inside uh, to keep it in the same shape as it used to have, mm. and uh, I'm using that uh, that way. Yeah. Speaking of, um, I don't know if this happened to you, uh, but I was, I was, I think it's both good and bad. They didn't shrink wrap them. Which yeah. Is good, but they sticker. They used the stickers, one on each side, which is great. But you cannot remove these stickers from the box because they will tear off the print. Yeah, yeah. Which is I like, cut the stickers. Yeah, yeah, you just have to cut the stickers, and forever these little stickers will hang off the edge, and it's really tempting to try and peel them, and you can't. <laughs> a bit less stick would have been nice. Um, I, I luckily I tested it on my mythic box, and that destroyed the side of the mythic box, and that's not too important because I'm keeping the mythic box inside the core box. Um, yeah, but I'd yeah. Say. Um, I I think that that like this game is very that like this game is very much it's a nostalgia thing it owes its success to a bunch of generation x and millennials who grew up with it and are like oh my god i get a chance to have this again because the out of print stuff is is so expensive it's bonkers how much you have to pay for all the bits and pieces how much you have to pay for all the bits and pieces isn't there an elf pack that was america only that's absolutely insanely overpriced yeah elf and warrior pack were insanely overpriced and they are US only. The the Ogre Horde, the against the Ogre Horde, in, instead is uh, European only. It's kind of raised, but since it makes use of the equipment cards, which in the US version were just a table uh, printed on a sheet, they basically uh, aren't as pricey as the as the Barbarian and as back. One thing left to say, which is the app. Uh, there's an app for HeroQuest. It's uh, an app which uh, allows you to play completely cooperative because it plays the role of Borkar or Zargon, as uh, as kids these days want to say. It's the US name. <laughs> and uh, I, I have to say one good thing about the app before uh, we dissect it, and it's that... Uh, Apparently, I always uh, I, I I like played this game bad for thirty years, which is a record in itself. Because when the dungeon gets set up, up you have only sight to where your readers can see. While I used to uh, prepare the dungeon until all those doors. Yeah. So, 
So basically, I, I I used the app to to understand that I was playing wrong for like forever. <laughs> since forever. Yeah, basically. yeah. yeah. The, the, I like the existence of the app because actually playing this solo or two player removes a lot of the frustration. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think the actual AI on the app does a good job of being fair with how it uh, attacks and targets. Um, targets. Um, yeah. I had a few problems with the app. One of them I think everyone will probably agree with is that Zargon's voice acting, which is pretty fun, grates <laughs> on you very quickly. Um, you end up muting the app, but that's fine. Um, yeah, and the music. The music yeah, is yep. kind of bad. It is kind of bad, yeah. Yep. It's kind of bad. It is kind of bad, yeah. Um, I had the game soft lock on me several times. Um, in fact, the very first time we played it, we got everyone out of the dungeon, and the game sat there as this chaos warrior, oh, sorry, dark warrior, dirdled about, <laughs> unsure what to do, and I couldn't close um, the the quest. I had to force close the app. The quest, I had to force close the app. Um, and that happened a few other times. Which sucks. It never happened to me. But the the thing I have to say about the app is that it does a lot of unnecessary things, and it's not clear that you can go without doing that. Or it's less that you declare the action except searching for doors or searching for treasure. Oh, well, because... well, I was yeah. going to say it's not entirely useless because sometimes when you cast spells, it'll roll the defense for the monster automatically. We discovered that, and I was like, "But we've already rolled defense for the monster on this oh, particular, well, particular well, spell." Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, it's not necessary because you can play that part. Of course. Yeah, yeah. It's just weird how suddenly it goes. I'm going to auto like it automates for us at least. It automated monster attacking, but not their defense, and we were like, "Okay, yeah, yep." Um, but maybe automate all of the monster stuff or yep, um, but maybe automate all of the monster stuff or let players roll all of it. I don't know. Um, yeah. uh, I, I, I did, I did like, I, I had frustrating times with it, but I think the existence of the app is great to actually let, you know, the experience of being a player, you know, the experience of being a player against yeah. somebody who's not really mean. Yeah, for, for instance, we are four in family, and the, the app was a lifesaver. Uh, the, there are a lot of frustrating th things about the app. I never had it soft lock, but for instance, uh, there's not a proper version for Android right now. Uh, only a few tab tablets are supported. Uh, as a programmer, I think uh, this is a problem with layouts of the of the pixel density of the screens. But anyway, you cannot play on tablet, so you are forced to play on phone. The and phone, it's, yeah, it's too it's, small. It's, it's portrait only, which is uh, very, very weird. It's a landscape board, for goodness sake. Why is it in portrait only? <laughs> yeah, so the, the, it looks like uh, someone at Hasbro saw the app for the stand. They saw, hey, I want the Hasbro saw the app for the stand. They saw... Hey, I want this, but I don't want to spend a lot on it. So <laughs> can you give me this, but make it really, really cheap? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And uh, as a programmer myself, I cannot condone this uh, mm. approach. <laughs> yep. Um, speaking of things, um, speaking of things that condoning and con and and commending, um, I I just need to touch back. I really appreciated the removal of the Famia from this game. Um, Games Workshop <laughs> have distanced themselves from Famia for a good reason, because the old Famia were very unpleasant. There are, were a bunch of hive creatures that reproduced by abducting abominations, which look like deep ones from Cthulhu, and that's got yeah. its own problems, but at least they're not Famia. Uh, I did I did appreciate that. Um and it's 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 a good change. I do think turning Chaos Warriors into Dark Warriors is a bit Dread laughable. Warriors. Dread yeah. Warriors. Chaos, Chaos is Dread. They could have made them animated suits or something. But yeah. yeah. The, the, the gargoyle is still the gargoyle. Yeah. Because it was the blood the blood tearster uh, in disguise. It was mm -hmm. basically the, the first uh, the first attempt at making the blood tearster miniature. It was there is a, a very rare uh, pewter alternate version, actually the first draft of the Blood Tister Mini. It was for Warhammer Fantasy 5th edition. And uh, if you are curious about that, uh, the scale of the original Hero Quest was actually the scale of the original Warhammer Fantasy 
methods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they, they, I do. I have seen some pictures of them and they are quite small. Actually, the reason why I don't have my, Euro, my original EuroQuest miniatures anymore because I dismember those to play with Warhammer Fantasy Battles and I actually regret it every day of my life. I'm sure there's a lot of people who did similar stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Basically, that's it. That's EuroQuest. It's a beautiful toy you can play. For nostalgia, it's a beautiful toy you can play for fun with kids, with your family. It, there is a bit of new stuff, there is something you can uh, play for historical reason, and it's the thing which is one and done. Uh, uh, actually, if you follow Twitter account of Zargon, it looks like they will expand it uh, a bit more. But yeah, uh, yeah, that's I, I... play, we'll see. I, I, I can't see why they wouldn't. They've had such a big success. They've had people saying, Hoi, look, get this into retail. You know what? Thick box contents out and everything, just get it out there. Because I hate these games that get very valuable for no reason other than they, they're just not in print. Yeah. If people want them and you've got the capability to make them, make them again. Give us against the Ogre Horde. Make us like groan about how terribly overpowered the Ogres are. Give us Wizards of Mordkar or Wizards of Zargon. Just the whole lot. And give us give us the little goblin who's hanging the poster of the Barbarian up on the wall. <laughs> give, give us all of that. That's a Twitter reference. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it, it, it's, it's not a good game, but I'm very happy that it's back. Yeah. It's also kind of fun. So it's yeah, okay. it's also kind of fun. So it's yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I was gonna say uh, to to be more precise, it is a bad game that is very fun and engaging. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, so you will have a good time playing it as long as you're cool with how it goes. Uh, a mess. Yeah, and if nothing else, you can have an immensely joy- enjoyable time going on, enjoyable time going on Twitter and tweeting at Zargon and yeah. seeing what you can provoke from Zargon <laughs> himself. Uh, and with the mocking voice of Zargon ringing in our ears, uh, that's all we have for time for in this episode. So thank you for listening to The Last Standee in 2022. You can catch us over at www.patreon.app. So it's goodbye from Alexis. From Belgium, goodbye. Goodbye from Alessio. Uh, bye. And myself. And remember, the second E in Standee is for escapism. <laughs>